Yesterday, Ontario members of provincial parliament took their seats for the first sitting at Queen's Park since the June election. And today, with a new larger majority government, the speech from the throne laid out the progressive conservative government's plans, including the fate of the budget they ran on. Here to help shorthand what was said and to look ahead, in Hamilton, Ontario, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Toronto Metropolitan University, Wayne Perozzi. And from the legislative building in the provincial capital, Cynthia Mulligan, journalist and political specialist at City News. Hi to you both. Hello. So we watched the throne speech. Cynthia, um, I wanted to start with you. After watching this, what do you think uh, is the overall message the government is trying to send to people in Ontario? Well, it's it's similar. It's almost the same as the spring budget that's now been reintroduced. But what I found really interesting is that it acknowledged the pressures on health care, which is a different tone even from yesterday when I spoke to the health minister about it. And it's also warning like there might be some belt tightening in the future because of inflation. So so it was a, a, a positive budget with a cautionary tale ahead. And we're going to come back to health care. Um, Wayne, what were your thoughts? Well, as, from, as speech, speeches from the throne go, it was quite similar to what you'd expect. Speeches from the throne are typically aspirational. They tend to be general. They touched on all the uh, themes that they identified both in their budget and in the campaign that followed the budget. So it was fairly standard fare in that regard. Um, I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, collaboration was mentioned a few times, potential. After listening to it, I felt quite hopeful. Um, there is a debate about whether Premier Ford will be, as one of his advisors once called him, a bull that brings his own china shop with him. Um, some people have said, you know, uh, that he's become more measured, having been Premier uh, the last four years. Which version of Premier Ford do you think we'll get, we'll get in this second term? Wayne, I'll start with you. But I think what, we, what you're going to see is a further evolution of, I think, a broader set of changes across parliamentary democracies and cabinet governments in, in Canada and elsewhere. And that's literally to a form of almost one person government. Uh, party becomes less important. And certainly party ideology becomes less important. Uh, everything focuses around the leader and around the institutions that have really been built up to support the leader, both in the premier's office and the cabinet office. Uh, there was mention of moving past partisanship. Cynthia, um, what do you think? Well, we did see Doug Ford evolve as a leader from his early days here at Queen's Park, which were, you know, as you mentioned, he was a bull in a china shop, and it was it was chaotic. COVID really changed him. He moved more into the central, more collaborative, worked with Justin Trudeau, the federal liberals, uh, a lot more. There's still, though, a little bit of the previous Doug Ford in him. He defied criticism and put his nephew, Michael Ford, in as a cabinet minister, even though he was just starting his, his career here at Queen's Park. Doug Ford didn't care uh, about the, the, the backlash that would inevitably come to that. He's also taken on Toronto City Hall. Uh, he's giving, giving stronger mayor powers in the middle of the election. Again, uh, not worried about the backlash. So there's still some traces of Doug Ford there, but I would say he is far more collaborative than he ever used to be. And I think that file is for multiculturalism, right? For his nephew? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to read something that Ma Matt Gurney wrote for us on TVO.org. Matt wrote, Premier Doug Ford doesn't excel at giving people bad news. He's actually kind of awful at it. And his whole persona is about blunt, sweeping declarations. Ford doesn't do nuance, never has, and possibly can't. In this moment, when precision and brutal honesty are required, we have a hyperbolic sales guy who loves to be liked. Um, Cynthia, is that a fair characterization? I think that's fair. He does not like uh, sharing bad news, and he definitely does like to be liked. And he does sit on the phone late into the evening talking to people, trying to win them over. And if you watch him work a crowd, he really takes time to work with different people. His own staff members will tell you that he gets very upset uh, if people are upset with him. He does like to be liked. But unfortunately, I think we're, we're entering a phase where there is going to be bad news that needs to be delivered by this government post-pandemic. And Wayne, or even current pandemic. Wayne, do you think that it would? Uh, do you think Ontarians want to know the bad news so they can prepare themselves for it? Well, I, I, I think for certain they want to know the bad news. But I also agree with what's been said that he doesn't like delivering bad news. And I think what we'll see actually is in the face of bad news, 
I think we'll see him pirouette. We'll see shifts in direction, shifts in initiatives. None of that would surprise me because he's bottom at the end of his day. He wants people to appreciate and to support him. Um, Cynthia, you mentioned healthcare. Uh, frontline healthcare workers, from doctors to nurses, are telling us that hospital units are a temper um, are telling us that hospitals, uh, public health, is um, under crisis. There's been a lot of conversation about the vocabulary that we're using. Is it crisis or is it collapsing? And I guess if you're in uh, need of help at the ER, I don't know if those terms matter to you. Um, you had the opportunity to speak to the Minister of Health um, and. And you asked her a question, and she said that um, the system, uh, the, that the idea that the system is in crisis is completely inappropriate. Those were her words. Um, given your reporting, how would you describe what's happening with healthcare? So I think that we are seeing a massive strain on healthcare, but let's keep this in perspective. And we have to remember, even before the pandemic, we had hallway medicine. The hospitals have been bursting at the seams for a very long time. Many say for two decades now, and I can speak firsthand. Six months before the pandemic, I had to take my own mother to the hospital and she was in a hallway. She's an elderly and older woman in the hallway for about 20 hours. And then after that, put in a sub basement of the hospital with about 200 other patients in a folding pen with one small washroom. So we have had major strains on our hospitals for many, many, many years. I think COVID has exposed it further. And yes, they're bursting at the seams. And when doctors and ER physicians and nurses, nurses quitting because they're, they're collapsing, we have to listen to them. Um, you know, there, the healthcare crisis isn't just happening in this province, it's happening across the country. And as Cynthia, as you mentioned, this is something that's been happening for a long time in this province. Wayne, how much of this uh, can we actually blame on the PCs versus generations of neglect and COVID? I would have to agree that, in fact, this is not something that just happened yesterday or two weeks ago. It goes back several governments, so both you know, liberal predecessors and the conservative predecessors to those liberal governments have a share to, to a blame to accept with respect to the hospital case. But what's really changed is the way in which governments go about deciding on priorities, making decisions, allocating resources has become far more centralized inside government to almost the exclusion of all else. So the collaboration piece might sound nice. I, I, there's very little evidence of that in reality. Well, I want to build on something that you just said, Wayne. Uh, this summer, the Financial Accountability Office reported that the government spent $1.8 billion under what they originally earmarked for health care. How could this happen given the state the system is in? Well, I, I think it happens because, for the most part, all decisions of significance now in this government, and I think to a great extent at the federal level, come out of the, the premier's office. All ministers have been reduced to bit players in this scheme. I mean, who could imagine? I mean, you know, if you don't mind me digressing, the throne speech ends with the lyrics from A Place to Stand, the song for Ontario Place. Very nice. Uh, and that reminds me of 50, about 50 years ago, Bill Davis was, was selected as Premier, 71, uh, as leader, led a huge majority, 75 seats in a much smaller legislature. It, could anyone imagine that Davis would have ever gone into an election telling his ministers like Darcy McHugh, Alan Grossman, Bill Stewart, Leo Bernier, sit in your writings, keep quiet, don't say a word, I'll make all the announcements, go knock on doors. You wouldn't have imagined that happened because ministers then had portfolios where they had rights to and access to the decision making within those portfolios. That doesn't happen now. You saw Sylvia Jones, you may not see her for five weeks after that. Mm. And that's what this government has really narrowed the path of decision making, which really begins to stress that system when a bunch of things are happening at the same time. Um, I, there's lots to get into, but I want to ask one more question around health care. Um, Cynthia, in their, the throne speech, the government said health care reforms, quote, will not be limited by conventional thinking that stifles innovation and preserves a status quo, end quote, um, that they will take bold action. Does this suggest to you that they might be considering some privatization? 
I, who knows, Sam? I mean, it's so uh, loose and up in the air. I mean, what I can say is they didn't offer any solutions and they're just giving us word speak at this point. And uh, some are taking that as a definite hint that it's privatization. Honestly, I, I, I can't say for sure what it means. Something else that came up in the throne speech, of course, because we're all feeling it right now, is inflation. Uh, Cynthia, how could a 40-year high inflation affect this government's plans moving forward? Well, I think, you know, it's going to put pressure on system. It definitely warns that this is a problem. Again, it doesn't offer any solutions, just that, you know, guess what? There, like, it does hint at austerity measures to come and that there might be some belt tightening, definitely. But again, you know, they, they sort of glossed over this. They acknowledged it and then they moved on. So we're just going to have to wait and see on that. In a few minutes, I'm hoping to talk to the finance minister about what that actually means and get some more clarification on how this could impact them. Uh, Wayne, um, Cynthia mentioned belt tightening, maybe something that a lot of us don't really want to hear considering how much more we're paying now. Um, the government, the Ontario government, is about to enter negotiations with education unions um, as contracts expire at the end of this month. Does one side enter this bargaining with the upper hand? Well, I think the upper hand, at least for now, rests with the, the, the unions that are involved and in, will be involved in these negotiations. I mean, in fact, Mr. Ford set the table for them earlier this year. What do, you do, he, what do you mean by that? Well, he agreed that they, they need to, you know, they need to be paid more, that they deserve a fair wage. And uh, he made it, if I'm on the other side, I'm saying, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to ask for a three year and I'm going to ask for 15, 16%, because that would be a fair wage. And he set the table for that, both with the teachers, with the healthcare workers, QP and nurses and, and, and the like. And well, of course, the, ultimately the doctors will get involved because they take their cues in terms of their pay raises uh, from what they see happening elsewhere within the system at the same time. Could they turn around and say, when I did say that, we weren't experiencing 40-year highs of inflation? Sure he could. <laughs> he could definitely do that. He could extend Bill 124 or revise it, change it to maybe 2%. Total compensation, 1% is remarkably low, by the way, but anyway, 2%. And then I think you'll see that most interesting thing is in the province will be, will be happening in civil society. The unions, I think, will engage in job action. They will not accept uh, anything other than what Mr. Ford himself has said would be a fair wage. Um, another theme that came up in the speech was building up the province. Uh, the pro progressive conservatives have massive infrastructure plans, including around $25 billion over 10 years to build highways like the 413 and the Bradford Bypass. Cynthia, how many of them do you think will actually get built? Well, I'm not sure any of them will be built within 10 years, to be perfectly honest, especially when you look at the 413. And we saw just before the election, um, there was a report saying that there are a lot of endangered species potentially in this land, and the federal government is now getting involved. And, you know, it has to be signed off by them. So there are a lot of hurdles to overcome before that can even possibly uh, be finished. So honestly, I, it, that is a ways down uh, before we'll ever see cars on it. Wayne, what do you think? Well, I think same thing, that in fact, the spending likely won't occur. It'll get stretched out over a long period of time. It'll give the ability, in fact, to, like I said, pirouette or pivot and become Mr. the premier that wants to contain the debt and wants to uh, not be a party to uh, government overspending. So I think I wouldn't be surprised if some get deferred, some get transformed into completely different projects. I mean, just take a look at the subway file and Metrolinx and what's happened there in the last, uh, during his previous term and the term before that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's like throwing darts. Maybe they hit, maybe they don't. Well, Cynthia, you mentioned uh, super mayors. This is not something that they ran under during the election, but something that Premier Ford has announced. He wants to grant the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa more powers that could mean the ability to override the decisions of council, fire and hire uh, department chiefs and control budgets. Why do you think he chose to do this? now well it's interesting timing because he did exactly the same thing after his first win when he decided to to cut toronto city council almost in half without warning never campaigned on it and shortly after he was elected ta-da here we go um I, 
listen, this has been talked about for a very long time. It was even mentioned when Dalton McGuinty was the premier here at Queen's Park. Uh, John Tory has mused about it himself over the last few years, and he's definitely in favor of it. This is a trial run. Um, Doug Ford uh, told me that after uh, about a year, they plan to expand it to other large cities like Mississauga, for example. Why do it now? I mean, I think he was a city councillor himself when his brother Rob Ford was mayor. I think he saw how things operated and he determined back then and there that if he was ever in his position of power, he was going to streamline it, make it more effective. And, and in his mind, this is what is going to help. And uh, Wayne Sidka mentioned the super mayors. It's not a new thing. Uh, McGinty suggested it many years ago. Why do you think that um, Premier Ford chose to do this now? I think Cynthia is right. He's very much react to what he himself believes he's come to know about an issue from his own experience. He's very much committed to that approach to action. Oh, I remember I was a counselor. I know this, I know that. And uh, it's on that basis that he decided both to cut the number of counselors. He thought it was all, uh, it was all a bit of a crazy town when, when council was meeting with 40 something members. And now he similarly decided things would have been a lot easier for Brother Rob if, if he had been able to do this or do that. So I don't think it's been thought out. I, I'd be very surprised if there are any documents inside the cabinet office that were created before the decision that would provide a justification for this, either a comparative analysis of other jurisdictions or an indication of pros and cons, costs and benefits. None of that paperwork exists. And I'm sure right now, public servants inside cabinet office are busy getting those kinds of documents done in case it ever comes to them having to explain things. I've read a few things that said that this super mayor um, privileges would allow maybe like a file like housing to move faster. Uh, the PCs have pledged to build 1.5 million new homes over the next 10 years. That's a goal of 150,000 homes per year. But last year, even with its best showing in 35 years, Ontario only managed to start construction on 100,000 homes. Yes, we are still in a pandemic, so maybe understandable. Um, so is it reasonable that they could actually manage to build 150,000 homes every year for a decade. Cynthia? No, I don't think it is reasonable at all. I think a lot of the problems with, with building housing or getting the permits going or getting the land available and getting municipalities to stop the NIMBYism and a, a lot of things that they need to do, for example, is add more houses to areas that already have housing. And a lot of neighborhoods get very upset and then you get local politicians who want to be reelected and they don't push for this new zoning to add for greater density. And you see it happen over and over and over again. In fact, it happens happened not so long ago in Toronto where one councillor reduced the amount of new housing that would be built in, in, in Etobicoke around uh, a transit station. So that is the main problem. And when uh, pre-election, Steve Clark, the Minister of Housing, announced new changes to housing and new guidelines, he didn't take the step where he could bigfoot municipalities and say, no, you have to do that because he wants it to happen at the local level. But I'm not sure it ever really will happen a whole lot faster at the local level because there are so many roadblocks put in place. And Wayne, I'm not sure, would you agree with me here? Well, I, I think most definitely the, the local issues are so complicated that you can't simply force things down uh, in terms of adding a 5,000 new homes somewhere. The question of services, the question of, of, of other uh, education uh, assets, all these things. And what's ironic and interesting is that uh, Bill Davis's government back in 71 and with their fresh off their election decided their solution to the housing crisis was to build brown new cities in the middle of nowhere. And they launched a, two or three of them. Uh, didn't work out either. Mm. So I guess now at least they learned that lesson that we got to build these houses where people already live. And that's what makes it far more complicated, far more drawn out and time consuming. And I'm guessing if you're trying to get on the ladder, just, I guess, more questions and maybe more frustration. And if you voted for the Liberals or the NDP, you might be sitting like, what is happening? Because the leaders of both uh, major opposition parties resigned on election night. Uh, both parties are busy finding new leaders and maybe doing some soul searching. Um, does this mean that they're too preoccupied to hold the PCs to account, Wayne? Well, I think most certainly the, the Conservatives are enjoy a free ride inside Parliament for the next nine, 10 months at least. 
unless outside events in the public realm have an impact on their government and people's view of them as a government. The liberals are concerned both with replacing a leader. I think they should, are also concerned and should be concerned, but whether or not they have a viable path forward as a party at the provincial level in Ontario. The New Democrats have the same, same leadership issue. They're in no particular hurry. Sometime February, they plan to have a convention for a new leader. But in the meantime, uh, the government will have free run inside the legislature. You know, it'd be like listening to crickets to spend any time watching the legislative channel. No offense to anybody here. <laughs> listening to crickets, I try not to laugh at that. Cynthia? I, I agree. I mean, there is no opposition right now. They are rebuilding. They both have interim leaders. I mean, the Liberals, it took them this long to just announce that they were going to have John Fraser back again as the interim leader. And they have to really do a lot of soul searching because they did not succeed in the last election. I mean, I would argue most, both opposition parties did not do well in the last election at all, with both leaders resigning that evening. So there is a problem. It also means in the legislature, the Ford government will have even more airtime. So, but at, at the same time, I would say um, the easy part was for Doug Ford to get reelected. Now it's going to be a lot harder. He has a lot more challenges today than he did a few months ago with this, the increasing strain on hospitals with inflation. It's only going to get harder from him from here. And, and the last two years, we've seen him focusing mainly on, on surviving COVID. Well, now we have to see him govern all areas again and get, you know, get back into sort of a normal governance style. Uh, we've heard about the... Easy. Uh, we've heard about the voting apathy from the last election, uh, but they were given another conserv uh, another majority. Looking back at their first term, what's one big policy success the PCs should be proud of? Wayne? Well, I, I, I think that their announcements in the area of infrastructure and their emphasis on the job creating potential of that, those infrastructure investments really rang true for a lot of Ontario voters. I think more generally what they, they captured the zeitgeist of the moment. People in Ontario by 2022, the pandemic had exhausted them. And not just physically, I think mentally, emotionally, in every way. And they simply just wanted to forget about it and get on with things. Cynthia? Totally agree with Wayne there. I would say one of the things that they've really accomplished uh, would, would be around electric vehicles, for example. And this is a massive shift from four years ago after it was first elected with the first budget with Vic Fideli. And they were sort of eliminating the previous Liberal government's moves on electric vehicles. I mean, they were taking out electric chargers. Now they're, they've really moved forward. They're getting, they want to be the hub for building electric vehicles in North America. And I would say that that is a move forward that they can be proud of and they've worked very hard at building and Monty McNaughton and Vic Fidelli have both worked very hard on that. Um, I think that is one accomplishment because I think it is moving uh, the whole industry forward and, and giving a future and creating jobs in a critical area. I'm so sorry. This uh, It's great that we can do these things, but there's always like a little bit of a lag. <laughs> so my apologies for stepping on you, Cynthia. The election just happened, so that means four more years until the next election. Uh, this government has a long runway to complete projects that don't, that don't involve just reacting to crises, responding to COVID outbreaks, hopefully. Um, they did mention no more lockdowns. Wayne, what do you interpret those long-term projects to be? Yeah, well, certainly, I, I think, you know, the emphasis is going to be on getting shovels in the ground. So I, I think the those that have the biggest economic impact are going to be the ones that are going to try to push forward at the front of this whole process. I think the other things, for, like Cynthia mentioned, the environmental assessments, in, in a number of the cases, it, it means you're not gonna get shells in the ground no matter how fast you think you can go through an assessment. So look for the shovel-ready projects, hospitals, campus additions at colleges or universities, uh, some of the, some of the, the transport initiatives, uh, twinning, say, the Highway 3 between Windsor, uh, Leamington and Essex. These are things you can probably get started quickly. Cynthia, um, you mentioned that uh, things are going to get harder uh, from now on for the government. But by the end of this second mandate, Premier Ford would have run Ontario for eight years. What do you think he wants his legacy to be? 
I would say building Ontario, uh, creating a more streamlined government, uh, and 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 building. You know, they are putting a lot of money into adding to hospitals. They are putting a lot of money into roads. I mean, his his mantra right now is building a better Ontario. I think that that is what he would like to be remembered for. And Wayne. I think the the end of the throne of the speech on the throne tells you that song about Ontario. He wants to be liked and really liked by everybody across the province, kind of like Bill Davis. He sees himself, I think, as a more modern inc incarnation of Mr. Davis, not in terms of policy views. As I said, that's no longer part of the the landscape of political parties, it seems. But in terms of this identity as someone who was respected and thought highly of by citizens right across this province. Uh, you've mentioned Bill Davis uh, a couple of times, and we're big fans of Mr. Davis because TVO, uh, as you know, that was his uh, initiative. Um, in our last minute here, Cynthia, um, it's rare to have a summer seating. Uh, what should we be looking out for in the legislature moving forward? Well, they're going to pass the budget. They're going to be scrambling to try and give better messaging on health care. I think that they stumbled out of the gate and, and didn't read the room properly, waited too long to address the ER closures. I think that they're going to work very hard to try and repair that and, and look like they are fixing this longstanding problem. That, I think, is going to be job number one. Wayne and Cynthia, thank you so much. I hope you had a chance to kind of enjoy the summer a little bit before we get back into the swing of things. Thank you so much. We appreciate your insights and your time. Thank you, Nan. The Agenda in the Summer with Nan Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.